So it is five past five. There are still some people coming in, but I think we will make a start. Um, and I'd like to uh, just start by welcoming everybody. Uh, good evening or good morning or good afternoon, whatever it is, wherever you are. Um, my name is Alan Finlayson. I am a professor of political and social theory at the University of East Anglia in Norwich in the UK. And I'd like to officially welcome and officially launch this uh, five day online conference on the topic of reactionary digital politics, ideologies, rhetorics and aesthetics. And today's session is on the topic of reactionary ideas and ideologies online and off. Um, but before we get to the main event, please uh, forgive me for taking up some of your time to kind of introduce the overall topic and to introduce uh, the series of talks that we're going to be having uh, this week. So this is the closing event of a three year research project supported by the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK. And that project had the uh, rather grand title of political ideology, rhetoric and aesthetics in the 21st century, a case of the alt-right. That project involved myself, I was the PI, along with my colleague Rob Topinka of Birkbeck at the University of London, Cassian Osborne Carey at the University of Warwick, uh, and Rob Gallagher of the University of East Anglia. So that project started in 2018, but of course the idea for it came um, from somewhat earlier. So my intellectual academic background is when it comes from an interest in political ideas and ideologies and rhetoric and the ways people disseminate political ideas, try to persuade others to share them, uh, and with how we become persuaded and come to identify with a politics and inhabit an ideology. And it seemed to me from around 2015, that it wasn't being particularly uniquely insightful in this, but I could begin to see uh, a kind of shifting and churning and rearranging of political ideas and ideologies taking place in relation to and online, um, especially on the conservative, the right wing part of the political spectrum. And that seems to be happening not only in the UK, but across Europe, in the US and beyond. One could see kind of increased fluidity and movement between positions uh, on the right of the spectrum from the far right through libertarianism and nationalism to in some ways more traditional forms of conservatism and particularly intensification of a kind of old form of anti-communism that was taking the form of a much more generalized anti-liberalism, it seemed to me, particularly in the form of opposition to anti-racism and to feminist politics. And all that was mixing with intellectual and academic currents that I knew quite well, uh, that were opposed to racial, gender equality, integration, multiculturalism and so forth. And while none of that was in itself necessarily new, it seemed to me that the way it was being articulated with with to and through, I suppose you could say, online culture. And the way it was spreading and being performed across platforms and giving rise to distinct sorts of self-proclaimed subversive subculture seemed to me to be an important kinds of phenomenon. And of course, some of that played out in the context of the Trump election in the US and the way politics has developed uh, since then. And my sense and understanding was and remains has been intensified by the project that what was going on was lots of distinct but linked phenomena that couldn't be reduced to a single cause, but were part of wider and deeper changes in how political thinking happens and how it's experienced. So of course, what's been going on the last decade is linked to socioeconomic changes, changes to how workplaces and the labor market are experienced, to different forms of asset as well as income inequality, particularly post 2008. And a lot of what is happening is to do with the efforts of organized movements and ideologues who've been honing their craft for a long time and are succeeding at winning converts to their causes. But it also seems to me that the technology of digital communication is having some kind of constitutive influence here, that the affordances and uses of online platforms have, for example, enabled the rise of new kinds of what I call ideological entrepreneur, individuals employing forms of popular style to build followers, extend networks, generate subscribers and income and promote anti-liberal political positions. And those entrepreneurs, as many of you will know, range from tenured professors of psychology, to unsuccessful graduate students, to professional opinion sellers, to anonymous people posting things on the internet, ideologues, exhibitionists, the whole spectrum of things. And that assemblage seems to me to still be significant. It's in flux, I think, especially after the Capitol Hill riots, insurrection, whatever you want to call it, in January. And new things are happening as American Christian nationalism refigures itself in a post-Trump era and as QAnon and anti-vaccine politics have also risen to prominence online. 
So there are lots and lots of things are going on uh, that I don't think are fully understood, certainly by most of my colleagues, I think, but really by none of us, because to understand them, we need to bring together a whole range of perspectives, methods and approaches. Media and communication studies is vital, but that needs to be supplemented by research into the history and theory of political ideas and ideologies. But all that work in political theory and intellectual history needs to understand better what's happening online, how the design, organisation, use and development of online platforms are shaping and reshaping political communication. We need scholars from rhetoric and performance and aesthetics to help us make sense of the ways in which politics is being represented online, specialists in the politics of racism and misogyny, and those with a detailed grasp of the political movements which have adapted to online spaces and developed new tactics to promote different kinds of right-wing activism. So that brings us to this conference then. What we've tried to do across this week is bring together people who can cover that range. Historians of ideas, media theorists and analysts, digital politics specialists, political scientists, and people working outside of higher education for think tanks, for um, movements and podcasts, looking at the ways in which online reactionary politics is developing. And I think in the audience across the week today and in the rest of the week, we have other specialists who've come to take part in these discussions. And the idea of the whole week is to really put the emphasis on conversation and discussion between panelists with the audience to try and bring together these different perspectives for understanding how digital media is changing the way politics happens and to think specifically about how that's changing things happening on the right side of the, of the spectrum. So I hope that gives you some context for what got us here, but you didn't log on to listen to me talk about what I've been in for the last three years. Today's topic, as I said earlier, is reactionary ideas and ideologies online and off. So trying to think about the histories in some cases of, the, of political thinking that are manifesting themselves online, how they're changing and shifting in the present day, and what's going on online and off and how these things are mutually influencing each other. And we have an excellent uh, panel and I think an unusual assemblage of interests and expertise to help us think about these things. So let me introduce to you then, first of all, Mark Sedgwick. So Mark is Professor of Arab and Islamic Studies at Aarhus University in Denmark. He's a historian of religion and religious traditions. Now his book, Against the World, Against the Modern World, Traditionalism and the Secret Intellectual History of the 20th Century is, I think, essential background provides a kind of an introduction to the sort of esoteric anti-modernist thinking that has shaped, well certainly shaped uh, mid-century and, and uh, interwar fascism, but has continued to exercise an influence beyond I think what most of us recognize and I think also an influence on people who might not know they're influenced by it. Um, so I think he brings an absolutely fundamentally important perspective on some of the deeper traditions that are shaping the way people are thinking about politics now. He also edited the essential uh, volume, Key Thinkers of the Radical Right Behind the New Threat to Liberal Democracy, which addresses a number of the specific thinkers that we've been looking at in our project that might come up in discussion today. Let me also introduce to you then uh, Eve e Giannoncelli. She was until recently Deacon Visiting Fellow in the European Studies Centre at St Anthony's College, Oxford. She's now a postdoctoral fellow at the Maison Francaise in Oxford. And her work is sit to the kind of intersection of intellectual history and the sociology of intellectuals, as well as political theory and gender studies. So she's interested in studying, has been studying uh, new forms of conservatism, particularly conservative anti-feminism uh, in France, Italy, the UK, and the United States, trying to compare and understand what's mm -hmm. happening, the kinds of official and unofficial intellectuals who are driving those kinds of political movements forwards. And our third speaker is Jean-Francois de who is reader in politics and international relations at Queen Mary University of London. So he's an international relations scholar, uh, but with a focus on political theory and intellectual history. He's written about Nietzsche, for example. And he's also written extensively and increasingly about the political theory and international political thought of the right in North America and Europe. He's currently one of the leaders of an international research project called Global Right, mapping new right ideas and agendas in the US, France, Britain, Germany, Italy, Poland, and Russia. So I think with those brief introductions, you can see why we invited these people and brought them together uh, to talk to each other, to talk to us uh, and to talk uh, with you. So the format is that each is going to speak for just up to 10 minutes, just to lay out their perspective and the way they see things from where they are. Uh, and then we'll have some exchanges uh, between the panel. I'll ask them some questions and they'll talk uh, with each other. Uh, and then we'll open the chat up for questions. You can write your questions in the chat at that point. Uh, we're really keen to hear from you. And then I'll either read those questions out or if there's time and opportunity, invite you or enable you to put your uh, camera on and microphone on and speak uh, to us. Uh, so I think it's gonna be a really interesting uh, discussion. But with 
uh, out further ado then, I'm gonna hand over to our first speaker, uh, Mark Sedgwick. So please, Mark, uh, take it away. Good, well, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. And I'm, I'm looking forward to what I hope is going to be a, a fascinating discussion. Um, I am, uh, the, the, the way I fit into this is as a historian and a historian of ideas. And I suppose that one of the reasons I've been asked to start this off is that the movement that I've spent a certain amount of time studying, traditionalism, is in a certain sense one of the most purely reactionary movements uh, that exist. Now, I'll say a little bit about it for those who, who, who don't know it, um, but just to sort of flesh this out slightly, it's a movement that has its origins short in France shortly before the, the First World War uh, that becomes quite popular in Europe uh, during the, the 30s, but especially uh, in, in rather limited circles in Italy and also in rather limited circles in, in Germany. Uh, and then really has its day twice. Um, it, it, has, it has its day as a spiritual religious movement, which is really how I got into studying it in the first place uh, in the 50s, 60s, 70s. But it, has, it also has its day as a political uh, movement in, in Italy in the sort of 60s, 70s. Uh, there was a group called Ordine Nuovo, which uh, got into some rather nasty terrorism. Uh, and then uh, it has its day again now. And when I, when I first wrote about this movement, uh, I thought that it had had its day. But then I discovered that a somewhat obscure Russian exponent of this movement by the name of Alexander Dugin was becoming more and more prominent and more and more widely known. And I discovered that the numbers, the, the Italian proponent, political proponent of this, Julius Evola, I discovered that his works were becoming more and more translated, more and more cited, more and more widely read. Uh, and then just to uh, just to, to make the point that this movement was of, of increasing relevance. Um, somebody called Steve Bannon started referring to these guys, uh, which really led, uh, brought them into the mainstream in, in certain ways, simply because everybody wanted to know who on earth were these people that Bannon was going on about. Um, they, they are also very present on the internet. Uh, the, the leading Russian exponent or proponent, Alexander Dugin, was actually one of the pioneers of the Russian internet, one of the first pioneering websites in the Russian language was uh, put forward by his people. And it's a movement which has grown on the internet has grown with the growth of the internet, also because the internet supports their more traditional um, forms. So uh, these, this, is a, this is a very intellectual movement. There, there are lots of books and the books are published uh, especially by a publishing house called Arctos. Uh, which is an online publisher. Uh, it, it occasionally says it's in London. It's, it's run by a group by different people from around the world. And the, the, the publishing house is very much a, an online publishing house, even though it publishes real old fashioned paper books. And the whole operation is something that is, is very much um, made possible by the internet. So this, this traditionalism is the, is the movement that, that, uh, that I'm, I'm talking about. And when I say that it is a 
purely reactionary movement or a very pure reactionary movement. This is because the two elements, the two central ideas behind the traditionalist philosophy, one of them is anti-modernism. And of course, anti-modernism in one form or another, critiques of modernity have been around as long as modernity it, itself. But the traditionalist critique of modernity is more absolute than any other critique uh, that, that I think I've ever come across. Uh, it is a critique of modernity, which is also based in an alternative to modernity. And the alternative to modernity, the, the diametric opposite of modernity understood by people in, in this movement is tradition. And tradition is defined as the timeless, perennial, esoteric tradition of humanity. So on the one hand, we have a vision of a perfect, divinely ordained order, which once existed, and which is more or less identical with the idea of good. And on the other hand, we have the negation of that divinely ordained good, and that is what we call modernity. And all the things in modernity that many people are foolish enough to regard with favor, liberalism, democracy, reason, equality, fraternity, a few other things like that, all of these are actually pure evil because all of these are the pure, are the negation of the original uh, di divinely ordained order. Now, that, that is a fairly comprehensive critique. And I think that the power of this critique for many people, and I've talked over the years with many, many people whose life has been changed by reading the works of these traditionalists. And I should stress that in many cases, they end up as monks or, or, or Sufis or, 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 or musicians or something like that. You know, they don't all end up uh, as, as political activists. But I've, I've talked to many people over the years whose lives have been changed by reading some of these works. Typically, well, there are two patterns. Typically, uh, in, at the age of sort of 19, somebody gets hold of one of these books and they stay up all night reading it and their life is never the same afterwards. Or sometimes you get people who have been going in that direction in various ways for 20 or 30 years of their life. And suddenly they come across this, this completely coherent, completely utter critique. And they think, that's it. So the strength of this, I think, comes from the way that the critique is paired with the alternative vision. And the alternative vision is very soundly placed in the past. Uh, the Middle Ages were an awful lot better than the present, but even the Middle Ages were a great departure from the Golden Age. Um, th this, this could be taken as the defining case of, of reactionary politics. Um, the core ideas are not unique to traditionalism. Traditionalism is part of a wider movement of, of criticism of modernity. If you go back to the 1920s, um, you have the whole neo-Thomist movement within the Catholic Church. You have other people 
calling for a new Middle Ages, a return to the Middle Ages, not just these traditionalists. But uh, the, the, they, the, their critiques have, have vanished with time, whereas this particular critique has very much stood the test of time. One question is whether the traditionalism of Russia in the 2000s can really be the same as the traditionalism of the Argentinian right in the 1930s or the of post-fascist Italy in, in the 1960s. And I think the answer is that, of course, it isn't exactly the same because any ideology which lasts for a hundred years has got to be flexible enough to develop and adjust to changing circumstances. But in other ways, yes, I think it is the same because this critique that I have you now referred to several times is, uh, is remains central to the whole thing today as it was in the 1920s. So uh, that's, those are my opening thoughts on, on traditionalism. Uh, it is present not only in its pure form, if you go and get the books of Evola, but it is part also today of a larger discourse. And if you simply look at the other authors who are being sold by Arctos, uh, who are being cited on websites like Countercurrents as well. There's, just, there's a close connection there. You, you see the family <laughs> to which Evola and, and the other traditionists now belong. And it's a family that includes the French New Right of Alain de Benoit and colleagues and successors, and the so-called neo-Eurasianism of Alexander Dugin in Russia. Uh, and then that feeds through into certain uh, groups in, in Turkey, uh, in Iran, and in, in the outside the, the West as well. Um, these groups all have something in common, but I think I've been talking for long enough. And it's time now for us to hear somebody else. Thank you very much, Mark. I think that sets us up for some of the thinking and discussion we're going to have later on. People will have questions, I'm sure, to find out more about the traditionalist influence. But you've also set us up very nicely to come to Eve, who I think may well mention Alain de Benoit uh, and others in her remarks. So let's hand over to Eve. Thank you very much, Alain. I'm also very, very happy and honoured to participate in this panel. So, yeah, what I would like to briefly address by way of introduction is the question of metapolitics in reactionary ideologies. So, for those who are familiar with online reactionary ideologies, metapolitics is a meaningful practice, but it is also a concept and a mode of conceptualization. And this is what I would like to focus on and on the ways in which it has been defined and redefined in the intellectual and political spheres in Europe and the US. So um, the main idea of metapolitics at, as it has been disseminated is that cultural power is the condition of possibility of political power. It then implies that in order to gain political power, one needs to conquer cultural hegemony, which means to elaborate and impose the vision of the world of man and society. But what is more interesting and which has less been, I think, thematized in such a way is that metapolitics has not only been presented as the preparation for political conquest by cultural imposition, but also as a way to distance oneself from politics. And it is this effort of distancing which seems to me of interest. Why? Because it shows a tension between politicization and depoliticization, which has a function, as I will explain. This can be observed if we take the example of one of the many theorists of metapolitics, we talked about him a bit before, the leader of the French, then European, and maybe now global new right, Alain de Benoit. It appears, for instance, in a manifesto, the manifesto of the French new right in the year 20, uh, 2000, 
by Alain de Benoit and Charles Champetier. They define meta metapolitics as follows. They say, metapolitics is not politics by other means. It is neither a strategy to impose intellectual hegemony nor an attempt to discredit other possible attitudes or agendas. It rests solely on the premise that ideas play a fundamental role in collective consciousness and more generally in human history. So here, metapolitics appears as a strategy of depolitization understood as a shaping of discourse at the cultural level. But in the political field, metapolitics has also been used. And a very, very good example of this is Marion Maréchal Le Pen, the French far-right politician or ex-politician, I should say, if we listen to her, because Marion Maréchal claimed to convert to metapolitics when she claimed to leave the political field as such in 2017. She created an Institute of Economic and Social Sciences. And she has since notably in the public discourses explicitly placed herself on the metapolitical level. Metapolitics has also traveled and been used by the so-called alt-right. For instance, it has been used in Richard Spencer's manifesto published in 2017 on altright.com entitled What It Means to be Alt-Right, a metapolitical manifesto for the alt-right movement. His manifest consists of 20 points and the fourth point is entitled Metapolitics, which is described as follows. Spirit is the wellspring of culture and politics is downstream for that. The alt-right wages a situational and ideological war on those deconstructing Europe European history and identity. So this definition of metapolitics has also been used as a motto in particular on the site Breitbart News. And one of the most meaningful embodiments in this case of the metapolitical strategy, according to me, is this picture that I'm going to share with, with you, where we can see the YouTuber, uh, the British YouTuber Paul Joseph Watson, literally putting himself in the hands of Donald Trump. And we could, we can have a discussion on this fascinating um, picture after. Can you see it? Okay. So um, it seems to me that these examples show what is at stake in metapolitics, which is legitimization. In the case of Alain de Benoit and the all rightist, it is a distancing from the most visible and the most violent forms of fascism. In the case of Paul Joseph Watson and Marion Maréchal, it is metapolitics is at, as a, at, as, at a rhetorical level, an endorsement of conservatism. And this endorsement is different because different national contexts are, are here at stake. But I think it is particularly interesting in the French context to the extent that conservatism per se as a label has been very difficult to endorse in France by the right wing. And that was made it possible actually for different fringe on the ring uh, in a very, very particular context, which, which, were, um, which, which uh, was the mobilization against same sex marriage and the panic, the real panic around gender ideology, which happened in France in 20. 12. And this allows me to turn briefly to a second point, which seems to me of particular interest about metapolitics, which is the growing role which is played by gender, sexuality, and feminism in it. So as we know, gender and sexuality have been at the core of reactionary ideology in the defense of forms of hierarchy, which find a privileged expression in the family. Because the family, of course, implies the respect of gender roles, it implies tying women to specific and determined tasks, reproduction and partnership. It also defines what sexuality is and can only be heterosexuality. But gender and sexuality also matters because they put at stake race, not as a social category for white supremacists, but as a biological reality, as illustrated, for instance, by the statement of Richard Spencer in his All Rights Manifesto. He writes, 
Women as mothers and givers are key to the future of our race and civilization. I think we will go back to online masculinity, masculinist metapolitics in, in other conversations. So I won't insist too much on that, on, on that. But what I would like to highlight here is the strategic defense of feminism, which may complicate the cultural wars. To understand this, I would like to go back briefly to Alain de Benoit. Alain de Benoit actually has understood very early that he had no interest in rejecting radically feminism. So he used it to, feel, to feed sorry, his intellectual matrix, which is differentialism. Very early in 1974, in an article published in the review he founded, Element for European Civilization, he made a difference between two kinds of feminism, what he called a, personal, a personalizing feminism and what he called an egalitarian feminism. He claimed you won't be surprised to encourage the development of the first while rejecting the second one. And he did so by developing an argumentative strategy that he used in the case of race by promoting ethno-differentialism as the right to difference for each people, which is in fact a form of cultural racism. But here he denounces egalitarian feminism, which that does not admit male, female difference as I quote, a particularly characterized form of racism. Shifting the question of difference to the domain or field of gender makes it possible to do what is no longer possible or hardly possible to do so directly in the case of race, which is naturalized difference. And I think we should pay particular attention to this strategic difference of differentialist feminism because it is a direct connection with more traditional and legitimate forms of conservatism, which develop more specifically this kind of argumentation. So these brief introdu introductory remarks highlight the importance of metapolitics as a work of adjustment and conceptual formulation and reformulation, which is actually, I think, a variation on what is probably the main issue of reactionary ideology, ide ideologies, which is anti-equalitarianism. So this is what I wanted to say to open up this conversation. I thank you for your, your attention and I'm also uh, looking forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, Eve. That's great. I think that fills out the picture that Mark had, had sketched out, gives us a different take on what's going on. So I come to Jean-Francois, who may pick up some of these themes, maybe the, I don't know actually what was going to say, but maybe paleoconservatism in the US and how this plays out in the international context. Please go ahead, Mark. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Alan. Um, yes, as Alan explained, I'm here because over the past uh, few years, I've been working on a research project on radical conservatism and global order, uh, along with a good friend and colleague, uh, Professor Michael C. Williams from the University of Ottawa. Um, so I speak on behalf of, of both of us in terms of the research that's been done here. Um, so I come to this from the perspective of the study of ideology, but it's called theory and uh, also international relations. So I thought I'd say a few things, a few words about this uh, to get us started uh, today. Now, I'm, probably some of the stuff I'm gonna talk about, some of you are familiar. Uh, but hopefully it'll be enough so that we can generate this question uh, in, in a subsequent uh, session. So one of the basic premises of the project uh, is that an important first step for those of us who wish to uh, respond to the challenges and in some cases perceived threats uh, posed by the, the, the radical right in America and Europe and beyond is to take its ideological claims and its strategic vision much more seriously. Uh, this is in line, I think, with Alan's project here. Um, so what, we're, what I'm interested in, uh, like my colleagues here, uh, mainly in our research, is not uh, far-right political parties as such, perhaps, or, or neo-Nazi foot soldiers or thugs, uh, but, but really the, the intellectual vanguard, if you like, uh, that has facilitated the, the continuation and the transformation uh, of radical right-wing politics and, and, and positions since the 1960s or so. Now, this vanguard, of course, is not unitary. Uh, um, 
but some of the key ideological movements uh, that I've been mind here include, uh, yes, the European New Right, which uh, Heath has been talking about, the alt-right, the North American New Right, the paleoconservatism in the United States, the American Renaissance, a whole, whole swat of them. Sometimes I slot it under the, the, under the label of the alt-right, but we can talk about the labels later. It's a bit complicated, but let's, let, I'm going to cut uh, to the chase here. Um, now, the new right, of course, is the, um, so I'm going to refer to these people as the new right for, for, for the purpose of that 10 minutes <laughs> introduction here. Um, now, these movements, of course, have different uh, histories and, and origins, but ultimately, uh, one can trace, I think, uh, a set of moves or some kind of origins to most of them to the 19, late 1960s, 1970s, and 1980s, a kind of reaction to the ideological realignment of the post-68 uh, moment, if you like, in, in, in many ways here. Um, and one thing that you will find, I think it is quite across in all of these movements in one way or another, um, was a shared uh, conviction that the cultural revolutions of the 1960s, 1960s had succeeded in politicizing all spheres of human activity, uh, conviction that parliamentary debates and government policies would from now on be uh, confirmed, would only confirm the results of the culture wars, right? and that the egalitarian principles of the left had become hegemonic in practically all civil society, state and international institutions. So there's a sense on the part of radical right that uh, the left had won the culture war in many ways, and that this is what um, these are the conditions on which the, the so-called new right began to rearticulate its politics. Um, the, under these conditions, the new rights concluded that the, the only viable strategy to challenge that cultural power of its adversaries was to turn the ideology, ideology critique of the left against its own universalist categories and its own egalitarian common sense. It's in that, and he, here you see in America, as in Europe, uh, an appropriation of Gramsci's theory of hegemony, a, a partial appropriation of the uh, Gramsci's theory of hegemony. You see some lots of flirtations with the, the with the, some some of the stuff of the Frankfurt School. It's an attempt to understand the role of culture in politics, uh, and this is of course is also mixed with good old fashioned conservative cultural politics and and, and de maître and, and all those thinkers from from the past as well. Um, now, the aim of this here, uh, as, as uh, Eve has explained, and this is what they often call metapolitics, right, was to reshape public debates on a theoretical meta level by rearticulating these ideas and concepts and meanings uh, in ways that uh, would help people to uh, uh, redefine the world around them and to provide the foundations for political movements that could challenge the left and dominant liberal orders. Okay. Now, um, these accounts are specifically designed to provide their audience with um, a framework of analysis, with a coherent ideological vision, and a practical political strategy for undermining those liberal orders. Now, um, one of the key ideas that you find across those different thinkers in one way or another and across those movement, um, is this idea that the world is increasingly dominated by a very particular kind of liberalism, okay? Um, that uh, many of those thinkers call liberal managerialism, okay? Now the argument rests on an interpretation of the so-called new class thesis that some of you may be familiar with, which they appropriate from people like Bruno Rizzi uh, and, and most notably James Burnham and other thinkers, okay? Um, Burnham wrote that book called The Managerial Revolution in 1941, which was highly influential in, uh, in American right in, in the 1950s, 1960s and onward. Um, in a nutshell, the main argument of the book is that if the main development of the 19th century was the emergence of a transnational working class prompted by the Industrial Revolution, the 20th century has been defined by the emergence and the continuous expansion of a new class of technically skilled administrators right, who are in the process of displacing the old bourgeois elites simply because the old elite lacked the skills to manage the mass societies that they had themselves created during the previous century. Okay. Now, so in this emerging order, a distinction between the ruling managerial elites and the masses would no longer rest on the actual ownership of the means of production, but rather on the control of the means of production 
and the ability of the elite to manipulate cultural symbols and state authorized mechanisms of mass organizations and economic redistribution. So in many ways, uh, lots of paleoconservative thinkers, alt-right thinkers, uh, the Benoit these days as well, and a number of other European new writers draw on this diagnosis as a means to provide a critique of globalization and understanding of how power and interest works in this, uh, uh, in, uh, the, uh, in the global liberal orders. Now they argue that today, liberal managerialism has become the determinant political reality of the Euro-Atlantic world and beyond. And in this account, members of the new class uh, range from corporate executives to university lecturers like us, uh, computer programmers, civil servants, bureaucrats, therapists of all sorts who occupy positions of economic and political power uh, in our contemporary post-industrial information society. Okay. Uh, so generally the interest of this managerial elite, that so-called new class, consists in maintaining and extending the political, economic, and cultural institutions that they control, while at the same time making sure that the needs for the technical skills that they possess are steadily increased. Right? So this is the world of expert that has been criticized so much in the Brexit debate and so on afterwards. So in their view, in this account here, um, um, this explains an important shift in the nature of liberalism during the course of the 20th century. Right? Whereas classical liberalism emphasize the merits of distributed powers, the virtues of self-government and the, the importance of protecting civil society and markets from state interference, managerial liberalism aims primarily at fighting prejudices, providing social services and welfare benefits, integrating migrants and punishing those who infringe on the rights of women, LGBTs and ethnic and religious minorities. It's a different kind of animal here. Um, now, crucially, Managerialism as a form of socio-political power, according to new rightist, is not restricted to the, domain, to the domestic realm, but is intrinsically globalist. Okay? And this is because of the new possibilities that large scale technology offers to address a wide range of old and new political questions and developmental challenges in light of a possible planetary treatment. Okay. So what experts in the domestic realm call administration uh, as its counterpart in world politics as international cooperation, decriminalization of aggressive war, collective security, international policing, peacekeeping, legalization, and so on. You see the expansion, the continuous expansion of that managerial um, uh, uh, structure, if you like. And so in this view, the real driving force behind economic and cultural globalization lies not in capitalism or realpolitik as traditionally conceived by Marxists or what it's called realist, uh, but in the ambition and in the capability of this managerial elite to increase its power by developing managerial infrastructures in societies where they don't already exist. Right? So the foreign policies of liberal democratic states play an important role in this process, but over time, the functional demands of these instruments of managerial organizations, along with the interest of those who control them, tend to outgrow the political logic of the national interest and raison d'etat. Okay, and Sam Francis puts it, he argues, he says, by integrating such infrastructures into a transnational order, managerialism actually contributes to the erosion of national, racial, and cultural particular particularism and to their replacement by a global cosmopolitan identity within the framework of mass organizations under the direction of transnational managerial elites. And this is what, for them, this is what globalization is all about. This is what it is, right? So new rights intellectuals are not uh, uh, conspiracy theorists. I think there is quite a lot of quite sophisticated theories in those arguments and the ways that these have been put forward. forward. I think we ought to distinguish, and I think we have to distinguish here, uh, um, those intellectual agencies from the delusions of QAnon and, and other groups of neo-Nazi crackpots who stole the Capitol, for instance, on Trump's behalf uh, in January last year. Uh, but perhaps you can see how the identification of the material and cultural contradictions of late modern capitalism with the concrete agency of the new class as the enemy 
of nativist values and interest in the theory of materialism facilitates precisely that kind of conspiratorial politics here. Um, and this has served as a really, really powerful vector of translation here um, between those much more sort of intellectual academic you know, right-wing account of globalizations, and, and many of those are published on, on Princeton University Press, and, and they're not in a perfectly respectable press, um, and the internet, and, and then those movements that we've been, you know, mentioning like QAnon and so on afterwards, and the alt-right, and, and all that. There's a lot more to say about these things, but I'm going to stop here because I think I've gone over my time already here. Fantastic. Thank you, Jean-Francois. Thank you, everybody. So, We've galloped through quite a lot of different things and open up a lot of kind of issues. Um, and before we come to questions from our audience, I want to kind of pick up on some of those. But I think we've certainly demonstrated that what we're talking about under the banner of reactionary politics is, is not merely reactive. It's a sophisticated ideological position that has a deep historical roots. Um, and that is quite astute, <laughs> is in some respects, well, I think many respects, much better at cultural politics than the left it opposes and has some in some respects a better understanding of cultural politics um, that is also appealing to uh, material interests as well as existential demands and anxieties and fusing these effectively um, and developing a, a, a serious critique of the of, of the contemporary state uh, i think for example in what jean francois was saying there you can see how uh, brexit contains elements of that critique of that denationalizing international state and is not just a kind of irrational convulsion but is emerging from some kind of framework of thinking about what's going on and what the tendencies are within states. Um, so I want to start though with a uh, perhaps with that with that in mind thinking about the people who come to adopt this kinds of politics, the people who have perhaps come across these things online, the believers, as it were, yeah, uh, who inhabit this ideology, uh, who are drawn to or attracted by the metapolitical forms of engagement that, that Eve has been talking about, and find this analysis explanatory, the one that, that Jean France has been talking about. So I'm just going to start by asking Mark to say a bit more about, you talked about how some of the traditionalists you've met have become monks. Um, and that kind of interests me because what one finds online is a certain attitude to politics in which one um, must adopt a kind of disciplinary uh, attitude towards oneself to cultivate a way of understanding and seeing the world that goes beyond and pierces the veil of liberal illusion. Is the, it, am I pushing that analogy too far? Or, it, or do you think there is something in that, that the ways yeah. in which people come to adopt this politics, but, but also because of course you talk a lot about how there's an occult knowledge that traditionalism yeah. is inducting into. And again, some of the presentation one finds online is, well, I can tell you the secrets of what's really going on. Here's the truth of what's happening. Yes. Um, you know, got this you'll you'll be a, you'll feel more powerful and part of a deep tradition is that is that a, a good reading yes no I, th I think i think that is good reading um and i think i mean going back to the to to to, to what Eve was saying about metapolitics um the, the metapolitics precisely as she was saying uh includes within it a certain distancing of the self from politics. And this is an idea which was developed by Evola under the concept of apoliteia. And this, here we have a, 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 a paradox for, for these people, because if on the one hand, uh, the managerial class has taken over, if modernity has destroyed tradition, if we have lost, um, what are we going to do? Uh, should we just get depressed? Um, and I mean, here for the people I've been working on, we have, we have the two possible responses. One of them is to go off and become a monk, uh, but the other is to become a sort of warrior monk. And the, the idea of the, the, the warrior monk is I think attractive because for a number of reasons. What, one of them is the, the extent to which it builds on uh, classic ideas of altruism and self-sacrifice and so forth. And if one's 
understanding if one if part of one's critique of modernity is the way in which it's very self-interested is is the way in which the the people possibly in the managerial class um but but possibly uh in 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 business and culture and so forth if if part of one's objection to these people is the way that they are self-interested a response to that which can prevent itself present itself as self-sacrificing uh becomes becomes quite attractive um it it solves the problem of how do we criticize politics as being mucky and yet engage in it ourselves. And the answer is that we engage in it ourselves at a distance. Uh, as, as, as warrior monks who are distant participants in something, not because of what we hope to achieve necessarily, but simply because action can be a form of nobility so you get you get the, these these ideas come up time and time again and they're connected uh to they're connected to Avila's idea of politeia and they are also connected to the the idea of 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 metapolitics uh i think it this raises a question about whether or not it is actually uh, anti-egalitarianism which is central to these to these things. The anti-egalitarianism is certainly something that's there. The uh, the preference for hierarchy is certainly something that's there. The preference for order over disorder is how is how it's it's quite often understood. Um, I mean, for the for the guys that I've been looking at, I think that the anti egalitarianism is actually secondary, uh, and what comes first is a an alienation from modernity, a rejection of modernity and then we say well you know what are the characteristics of this modernity that we're rejecting and one of them is the idea of equality which of course is understood as an illusion because there is no equality there can be no equality not just between genders which doesn't terribly interest some of the traditionalists um not particularly between races which uh is a concept that some of the traditionalists actively criticize uh Evola was publishing amazingly Evola was publishing books in nazi germany in the 1940s criticizing nazi racial teachings as as uh, as being simplistic in his view, but the idea that there that there that there can be equality between different sorts of human being, the idea that the warrior monk is the equivalent of the trader, the idea that the trader can be the same as the the farmer, uh, that that this this a rejection of that understanding of sameness is uh, perhaps more important. Long answer to short. <laughs> Thank you. Jean-Francois, did you want to come in at one point then? Did I see you come forward? Did no, you... no, sorry, I'm, I'm listening very... <laughs> okay, okay. So, so I think that sort of fills out some of the kind of potential self-conception that traditionalism can kind of generate in those who, who either consciously kind of adopt it or are kind of picking up sort of waves of it that there's a kind of deeper knowledge and a kind of a hierarchy that you can kind of recognize that you belong to through your sort of spiritual political warrior monk kind of dispensations that the internet kind of helps people um, become attracted by because it provides you spaces and places to demonstrate 
your superiority over others in argumentative combat or in in playing and gaming the system and and showing you know in, imposing your views on others um, i think it creates a kind of interesting way of thinking what you're saying gives an interesting way to think about some of those things that are happening there but if we move from thinking about the kind of the sort of subjective disposition of those who might become attracted to traditionalism to thinking about what are the kinds of ways in which people are persuaded to adopt or take up not just traditionalism, but the, the many forms of reactionary politics that we're that we're talking about, and that brings us back to this issue of meta politics and the kind of um, the 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 cultural practices that Eve was in part talking about under the heading of meta politics. So, Eve, Eve, could you say more about the this idea you touched on with your image of Paul Joseph Watson as the kind of counterculture that what one's being invited to is a kind of subversive form of Countercultural, counter modernity. Um, you know, how do you see that sort of playing out in these kinds of contemporary movements? How do they sustain the idea that what they are is part of a of a counterculture? And is that an important part of this metapolitical legitimization that you were describing through Benoit? You have to unmute before you <laughs> tell us. <laughs> Yeah, I think that counterculture is an important question, but what is interesting, for instance, in the case of Watson, is that he's very ambiguous, you know, towards the question of culture, because uh, in some way he tries to promote culture in a very, very um, traditional conservative sense. In, um, I, I mean that he promotes high culture, but at the same time, he tries to be interested by forms of uh, popular culture. Um, but what is interesting in his attempt, for instance, to, to promote uh, popular culture is that, in my opinion, um, he fails. And I think that actually the, the image of Trump is very interesting per se, because actually we have this motto, which is very, very interesting, but which is some kind of empty signifier in the end. So when it's a conservative, it's a counterculture. And when we just, you know, uh, like this in the end of Trump, he's saying something, but he's also saying nothing from a real cultural point of view. I think it, it's what is, it is something which is very, very interesting. Um, yes, yeah, so I don't know if, if some of you are familiar with, yes, uh, the ways in which he has spoken, Watson, for instance, about popular culture, but it's very, very inter interesting because sometimes he tries to speak about, you know, movies by real men and movies who, uh, who, which, do, which do not, um, you know, promote girl, girl power and those kind of things and so on. He tries to speak about uh, um, music and so on, but 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 the, the, the very content of culture is never really here. So and I think it is quite interesting. There's quite a lot, there is quite a lot of stuff uh, adjacent to this about, you know, critiques of the culture industry that films are no good anymore because they've been undermined by uh, political, you put, yeah, political uh, correct. feminism, yeah. by yeah. representation and so forth, but it sets up that sense of distance from the culture, uh, which seems to me to resonate with some of the things one finds in traditionalism, that one's not satisfied or able to relate to that, so then we, then one is being offered kind of alternative ways of experiencing mm -hmm. oneself and relating to the culture. Mark? I, I think that this business of the counterculture is extremely important, and uh, this explains something that we haven't mentioned so far, which is the way that politics into this, this, this variety of politics interfaces with certain aspects of the music scene. Mm. And especially uh, here in the North, we have the, the Nordic, uh, the, the whole phenomenon of Nordic dark rock. Um, but I think it's, it's also relevant that uh, Dugin's first appearance in Russia was as a leader of something called the National Bolshevik Party. And the National Bolshevik Party, in my view, was not a political party at all. It was a counter-cultural club, closely connected, I seem to have a lot of C's here, uh, closely connected to the punk scene. In, in Russia at the point. So the yes, the, 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 the countercultural attraction is, I think, an extremely important one. And uh, 
a point that is sometimes made by these people is that the left has become so establishment, so conservative, so boring, that if you want to do something really different, come over to us. Can I come to Jean-Francois? Jean you want to say something? There? Yeah, I mean, I think another, another, another dimension of this as well is that so Mark made the point about the left. I think you know, I think that's absolutely right. But it's also a means to take the distance from from the mainstream, the conservative movement, right? Is that you know conservative parties are establishment. Conservative parties are trying to conserve a world that no conservative should try to conserve. Right? The, 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 there's nothing left to conserve for a genuine conservative politics. Right? This is why it's radical conservatism in a sense that you know we, in their eyes we've gone. The, the the degeneration of the, the ravages of modernity have gone so far in that there is very little that we want to preserve. So what conservatism must do is to build a new order outside of the establishment, right? You cannot simply put in a political party in, in the machine and then be elected and, and, and you, know, you have to work from the outside. And this is why it's countercultural. This is why they talk about resistance. This is why they talk about conservative revolutions, all, the, all those kind of terms that ultimately you would associate with the left, but not necessarily with conservatism. But you, know, you see that in the paleos in the 1980s already, in the 1990s afterwards, the alt-right in America, you see that in Benoit in this complete infatuation with the German conservative revolution, for instance, and this, this idea that we've got to transcend uh, uh, you know, the kind of like the twee conservatism of, 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 you know, of, of, the, of bourgeois modernity, basically. I think that's absolutely central in this. You also see how they rejoin arguments made by the Frankfurt School, and you can see uh, there, are, there are some, you know, so in many ways they're very critical of, you know, what they call cultural Marxism sometimes, and so. Um, but ultimately, in many, in many, many ways, many of these thinkers, I mean, actually found a lot of good points in Adorno, Olkheimer, Marcuse, and all these people. Like Godfrey studied with Marcuse, for instance, right? Uh, Sam Francis and Godfrey were part of the Telos board, went on the Telos board in the 1990s, if you know that journals in the United States. Um, and one of the points that, you know, that sort of separates, if you like, the, you know, the paleos in America or the radical right and, and, and say the neocons is to do it, is how do you respond to the, the cultural industry, right? So when, when Adorno comes in, in, in the 20th century and says, well, um, you know, capitalism has avoided a crisis of legitimacy by commodifying the, the, the counterculture, right? By basically sort of subverting the counterculture in ways that it has appropriated it, let's say, imagine with the media industry and the advertising industry and basically all this kind of avant garde sort of groundbreaking dimension of left wing politics gets integrated in capitalism as a means to sell, to sell cigarettes and Coca Cola and get people to buy more cars and all this. And so consumerism, right? Um, you know, people like Daniel Bell and the neocons will, will become neocons later on in time. We're also seeing the same thing. And they said, well, you know, we've got a problem here. We save capitalism, but we have integrated a subversive logic, cultural logic into capitalism that is going to mine the normative basis that we need to, we need to maintain American society in, in the face of, you know, racial disparity and you know, poverty and all that. Um, and there's lots of anxiety here. And what the neocons do at the time is that they say, well, we need to mobilize the state as a means to and use it for you know, punitive policies to basically enforce a normative consensus on American society that will regenerate the cultural basis that capitalism needs right, to function. Um, you know, what paleos move away from that and they say, well, that's nuts, right? This is, this is basically the managerial states for conservative people. This is basically the growth of the state. This is a conservative welfare state. This is basically, you know, this is not conservatism. This is a big state liberalism. And, 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 and this is going to destroy the conservative movement. And for saying that, they get basically ostracized from the conservative movement in America. And then they, you know, they find themselves siding with left wings and, and, and people on the radical left who, you know, rehabilitating Schmidt and Telos and those people. So that, I think that countercultural dimension here is very important. And the nexus, the, the proximity of those arguments with radical left wing arguments, you know, mustn't be underestimated. There are lots of, of, of interesting um, overlaps. Uh, for sure. So I'm just going to ask my colleague Rob to kind of open up the chat. I can see there's one question, one hand raised already, which I'll come to uh, in a minute. But I think we can see how, um, so the chat is now open for asking for questions. But I think what we 
achieved so far, I like to think, is kind of getting a kind of part of a map of this in, in, in place that, that shows how the ideology uh, is kind of in part organized and works, how it directs itself to present an analysis of contemporary politics of a certain sort, but also how it invite, has a kind of inviting rhetorical appeal uh, you know, for people who want who, so they can feel as outsiders anti-establishment, but also can be affirmed in their outsiderness and have their sense to become, might be, become some part of, a, of the new warrior monk, warrior um, elite. Um, so I saw, I hope it wasn't actually, but I saw that Paula Deal had her hand up. Does Paula still have her? She's taken her hand down. I thought she had a question to ask. Um, but uh, so while comments and questions kind of come in, I want to pursue that sense of the kind of rhetorical dimension, because that's my particular interest in all this is, is these forms of persuasion that are kind of inviting people to identify with these kinds of movements and that, and that are somehow unifying this kind of countercultural punk dimension with the uh, with the side of it. So uh, Paul is back up, but I'll come to, uh, can, can we take Paula's question mark? Is that okay? So P Paula is, uh, comes to us from the University of Kiel. She's a populist specialist research in populism. So if we can unmute Paula and hear her question, that would be great. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I really enjoy and listen to you. I have a question, I guess, for everybody. Um, um, I was wondering if we cannot talk about a kind of um, postmodernism influence on the extreme right in the 60s, right? But then there is a new twist right now with the internet. And I will come back to the um, change in media in the, in the end of the 90s, where you have uh, a, a lot of uh, mixed genres in mass media and confusing genres in mass media. So can you, I, I, it's just an idea. I, I'm not so sure if it works, but um, do you think we can talk about a kind of Gramsci 2.0 by the extremist right, right wing today, um, which is a kind of development of Gramsci practices that the left was not able to develop? or? Would you reject the idea? I, I'm, I'm just curious how do you react to that? Thank you. Who would like to respond? Anybody immediately? I mean, there is yeah, Jean Francois, please. Thank you, Paula. This was this was a great oh there you are. Sorry, you've been moving in my screen. Uh, this was a great uh, great question. Um, yeah, I think in I mean I think yes and no. Um, actually, I just I just emailed a, a paper to to Alan this afternoon, um, which we just published in Michael and shameless self promotion here, which we're basically talking about precisely the, the, the issues that you've raised is the ways in which the new right has appropriated post post structuralist post modern critical theory and, and, and Gramsci and so on for their own for their own purposes here. Um, I, mean, I think yes, I think there is definitely this this attempt at, you know, working with those ideas. Um, the postmodernism, for instance, is you know for them it's, it's, it's perfect. It's the end of meta narrative. It's the end of you know epistemological certainty, which then opens up the you know against the path for myth, uh, for you know all sorts of things that you know were not uh, you know deemed to be you know acceptable in academic or, or in the social scientific frameworks. In many ways, uh, if you know if we live in a postmodern world, why not tradition? Right? Why not? Why not going? Why not? Why should you know? What's wrong with telling women to go back to the kitchen? Right? Why not? You know why? What? Why should gays not go back into the closet? Because ultimately, this is my preference. And you know, so there is that sense where postmodernism has, has opened up that kind of you know that space for making those arguments in the ways that you know you can see how rhetorically you know it's very attractive and there's also it leads to all in all sorts of silly directions very often. Uh, but also, there is a more serious kind of challenge here to how do you respond to that from you know from a critical left sort of perspective and trying to deal with those arguments. Um, the, now, is that is are they doing Gramsci better than the left? <laughs> I, I mean, I'm not qualified. I'm supposed to personally to you know to end, I suspect no. <laughs> uh, I, I suspect that their their reading of Gramsci is is, is actually probably quite superficial, um, and, and and they're quite explicit here that for them you know this this doesn't that the. the this idea that there is a rational class consciousness that binds everything together that you find in Gramsci somewhere, right, uh, um, goes away here. This is not basically what 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 gets what gets society together is family tradition and all these things. And class consciousness is one stream of, of a form of solidarity, but definitely not the one that is, you know, sort of getting everything together. So I would say, you know, <laughs> yes and no to, to your question in that regard. 
Mark, you had your hand up to respond there. I, I would say yes, without the no. Um, I, th I, th I think that perhaps if we want to find something which is central rather than anti-egalitarianism, I would suggest postmodernism. Um, I, I, would, I would mention that Dugin himself understands himself as a postmodernist. Uh, he follows that argument explicitly. And I'd suggest that it's not just building on Gramsci, that in some ways, my, my, the traditionalism that I work on uh, was, was postmodernist before the modernists. Because you know, if, if one's questioning all the claims of modernity, the truth claims of modernity and so forth, um, this, this is a very postmodernist position. And traditionalism, conscious traditionalism, is by definition postmodern. I mean, I wonder if, if there is something I mean, to pick up on pa pa Paula's question about if, if we're thinking about the, sort of the cultural terrain of culture as a kind of terrain of ideological struggle. Uh, I mean, Gramsci, of course, is thinking in large part about basic political education uh, and informing people about history and politics and society and culture. And he's also thinking particularly about newspapers in a print world in which argument takes the forms that we associate with print, certain kinds of linear uh, structures and developments of argument. Now, what we live in now, of course, if we think of the internet, is, is, a, is a kind of visual textual kind of melange that is continuous, and it does, is spatial and spreads out all over in, in different kinds of directions. And I wonder if there's something about that that is not hospitable to the kind of political hegemonic activity that Gramsci and that traditional liberalism on the left has in mind. And that actually the forms of politics we're looking at are more able to adapt to because of the ways in which the medium uh, communicates image image wise and through connection and proliferation rather than through unfolding of certain kinds of structures of argument. And I partly raise that because I want to ask Eve something in, in relation to this, which I think links back, which is what Alain de Benoit says. Um, somewhere I forget where it is, and one of it'd be one of the translated essays, so you can probably guess which it is, about how the forms of politics he's talking about should be image-based and affective and appealing to people at this kind of deeper level that, that undercuts the kind of liberal rationalism. And so will, will away, he says awaken people to their kind of deeper understanding, which makes me think of some of these things we're talking about, different ways in which culture and communication are playing out now. But also, of course, we haven't talked about this idea of the red pill that is so central to the kind of alt-right of a kind of awakening that is experienced and gone through rather than one that is sort of rationally uh, reached. Does that, does that make, am I right about Benoit there, Eve? Uh, yeah, I'm not, the connection with the red pill, I'm not, I'm not really sure, but uh, I don't know if someone wants to answer before, just... Um, I'm putting you on the spot and asking you to tie a lot yeah, of... And I, yeah, because I can see what you mean, but I mean, the, I think it's, yeah, it's uh, rhetorically, I'm not sure that, yeah, that it works so well, but I may be wrong. Um, I'm trying to to think uh, at the same time uh, while answering you. So someone want to, wants to answer? <laughs> Mark? Yeah, but um, yeah. I'll try. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, th I think that the, the red pill idea, which is indeed absolutely central, mm -hmm. um, is a very elitist idea. Uh, and we, we have a, one thing that distinguishes the right from, from, from the left is the left was very interested in, in class consciousness and had, had this idea that truth could be recognized by large numbers of people. Whereas the right believes that in circumstances of modernity, the truth by definition cannot be recognized by large numbers of people because that's how it is in modernity. The truth can only be recognized by small numbers of people. Now this then leads us into ideas of hierarchy and the idea of the, of, of the warrior monk once again. Uh, how do you know that you're a warrior monk? Because you have perceived the truth. And whether this is understood 
in terms of, of a red pill, as it's understood very, very often nowadays. This is the, the image which is currently uh, most important. But if you go back to the 1920s, now it's a question of how many people actually understand, can understand the tradition, uh, which, which is, is, much, is much the same idea. So that's one. Can I can I ask uh, Mark a question? Of course. Yeah. Would you say that Alain de Benoit is a traditionalist? Uh, he says he's not, but he knows an awful lot about it. For somebody who isn't a traditionalist, yeah. he's published an awful lot about it. He did the most amazing bibliography of everything that Evola had ever written. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I he mean, says, I, I, I haven't read, uh, you know, I, I don't know much, uh, Evola, I haven't read him much. Oh, okay, yes, well, I think, I think, I mean, Evola, uh, I, I think he probably knows Evola better than Evola knew himself. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think what he means, I, I've been thinking, I've been trying to understand for years, actually, what it is that he means when he says, I'm not a traditionalist. Um, I think one of the things that he means is uh, uh, I am not a practitioner of, of genolatrie. Um, there's, there's this, this, there are a number of people who are dedicated followers of Genon, the chief traditionalist, and try to protect his word as if they were you know, guardians of the holy flame or something like that. And, and today's tradition is extremely critical of these people. Um, and, and Dugin describes these people as, 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 as being akin to stamp collectors. Um, you know, they're, they're not doing anything useful at all. And, and I think one of the things that Benoit is, is saying is, I'm not just a stamp collector. I, I am an original thinker in my own right. And uh, I am a wide, and this is this. He is he is a very wide ranging thinker. I mean, he's he's extremely inventive, but he builds on a lot of these ideas. And to that extent, I think really, in many ways, he is a sort of traditionalist. Yes, Jean Francois, you have raised your hand there. Okay, you are on mute as well. Sorry, I, I saw, that, saw that a question before me, so if she wants to go first, that's... that's sure, it. let's bring in, so Saul, colleague from Goldsmiths, and uh, writes about anarchism, political theory. Saul, please join the conversation. Unmute myself. Uh, thank you very much. It was a great discussion, actually. Um, just on the point about postmodernism, I mean, surely this is quite different from postmodernism in the sense that this, 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 this movement seeks to impose a new kind of meta-narrative, doesn't it, based upon you know, conservative uh, and, and patriarchal values. I mean, it's very different from the kind of the, you know, the hermeneutic playfulness of, of postmodernism, I would have thought, but that, that's just a kind of a, you know, an aside really. But I just wanted to ask, I mean, aren't we sort of attributing too much importance or credibility to this movement by, by calling, calling a serious sort of intellectual movement? It seems to me like a, a kind of a, you know, sort of a hodgepodge of quite trite and, uh, simplistic uh, ideas really. I mean, I, I'm kind of giving it too much credit by, by kind of, you know, understanding this as a sort of a series of intellectual, um, uh, you know, uh, sort of movement or ideology. Uh, I, I just I just wonder that we're, we're kind of um, giving it more credit than it's actually worth. Does it, Jean Force, why do you want to respond? You're muted still. <laughs> am, I, am I muted? No. no, a year, a year and a half later, I'm still having uh, <laughs> quick figure out the Zoom thing. Um, yeah, I can, I can try to maybe sort of. So just um, so are we giving it? Okay, I think that you know, inevitably, um, when you do an event like this, you, it, it ends up coming out as a, we, first of all, it, it's a lot more diverse, perhaps, and than, 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 mm. than, than we're. I, I don't think that there is a a new right ideology, for instance, there is, you know, many different new rights writers, a bit like the left, right? They disagree about lots mm. of things. We talk about the new left sometimes, that, you know, lots of people on the new left would be quite angry at hearing that we, you know, we put people in the same bag. And, and I think there is some of that. The other thing is inevitably, 
yeah, what you focus on these things and you try to understand how they appeal. So yes, but also, but I do think that there are some thinkers um, in, in, in there who are actually serious intellectuals who've done some serious work. What happens a lot is that when that gets translated into the sort of, you know, sometimes when political theory gets translated into, let's say, ideology and something like that, designed specifically to mobilize a particular, uh, and, and I know it's not problematic to define it that way, but you just see where, where political philosophy gets translated into, a, then of course the, the nuances can, can, get, can, can, can get lost. Um, so my answer would be again yes and no. Uh, de it depends where you look and depends what you know mm. how you think about these things. But part, part, I think part of the importance of, of the project here, or at least why we're here, is because you know they've understood something that we don't. Because clearly they're doing pretty well um, in in many ways. Right? You, you know, we had Trump in the White House not so long ago. You've got you know far right political parties. So there is something here that is. Uh, appealing in that sense. To your point about postmodernism, Sal, I think I think you're correct. But also, I mean, um, it's also about the ways in which they mobilize postmodern tropes mm. to pursue conservative agendas. So mm -hmm. yeah. I think you know, uh, postmodernism opens up the possibility of making the argument of like, you know, why not patriotism, right? Mm. Why, why not tradition? Why not? Um, and in that sense, you know, that's why perhaps it works for them. Um, for the Benoit, I think the at least my understanding is that we also have to put those this is again this is this is ideology ideological battles right um benoit will say something in a particular context that he would not perhaps say in another context sometimes he makes alliance with you know let's call them mainstream conservatives sometimes it, you know and that, and i think that we always have to be in many ways he's not very committal in the ways that he writes like i think like mark said i think he's very very knowledgeable in traditionalism and in some ways i would probably put him put him in that camp but i think that he's also you know quite he's managed to put his position himself in france as the you know one of the, my, the main ideologues of the, of the French New Right. He advises, you know, Le Pen and people, and so he, does, like you say, he doesn't want to be just a stamp collector. And 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 if you if you become a kind of a Renaud Gano figure, some kind of esoteric sort of mystical sort of, you know, it doesn't really speak to the kind of politics that he's it is trying to sort of, you know, by. So I think these mm. things, and it's the same thing with people like Paul Godfrey or Sam Francis in the U.S. For instance, you look at the, the things that they would say in certain contexts, uh, it would be very different than they would say in, 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 in others. So it's 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 also it's very difficult sometimes to pigeonhole uh, these thinkers. Anyway, yeah, that was fine. Sure. Well, I know I'm, I'm abusing chairs' privilege all over the place here, but I'll bring in Mark in a moment. But I think but I think saw so your question kind of is interesting. Partly that there is a kind of methodological problem when you study something that you impose a kind of coherence mm. and order on mm. it that overstates it but at the same time i think what we're talking about here that you know this it's a loose and broad collection though these are also political intellectuals in the sense of people thinking about how to strategize and act in and on the political world and very specifically and quite consciously thinking in a, in a gramscian kind of way how do we win back ground in the war of position that we've lost to the post-60s liberals and they have been very successful at, at, at that in many respects and I think that you cannot underestimate the extent to which they do dominate certain parts of the political internet to a degree that is not appreciated by people in um, sort of you know mainstream official politics and are, are at that sort of level successfully carrying out a meta-political strategy to push back on uh, aspects of egalitarian politics and and you know and that is part, part of what is playing out at the high level of politics whether it's Brexit I mean there, you know the um, the influence of people we're talking about on the conservative government or at least their vocabulary i think is clear it, it, it feeds in the kind of mm. culture wars around football at the moment mm. these are elements of this so yes one couldn't attribute them to a very fully wrought out strategy that said let, let, let's intensify the antagonism around football but there are connections here that need to be understood and thought sure. um, but i should come back to to, to to our guest mark you had your hand raised yes i mean i i i, I think that there are undoubtedly parts of the radical right that are conservative and patriarchal. Um, but it's it would be a mistake to think that the whole of the radical right was conservative and patriarchal. And if, if that was all it was, there wouldn't really be much of an issue, I think. I mean, uh, a lot of the people who we've been talking about are, are not 
that there, as, 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 as I think as Jean-Francois said, you know, there's nothing left to conserve. They're not conservative in that mm. sense. Yeah. And they're, they're absolutely not interested in, in, in patriarchy. Uh, and if we, if we try, if we, if, we, if we understand them in those terms, if we fail to recognize the intellectual seriousness of what they're producing, we're not going to recognize what's hitting us. I mean, if you look at, at, the, at the beginning of the Trump administration, you know, how do we understand what was going on there? This extraordinarily odd appointments of all sorts of people to various positions. Well, we can understand it as being incoherent, or we can understand it as being an attempt to destroy the managerial state worldwide, mm. um, which, uh, you know, um, I, 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 was, I was watching a, uh, a debate in the Danish parliament earlier this month, which ended up with parliament passing a resolution uh, which basically suggested that, uh, well, now, I mean, which was very problematic for many humanities researchers, shall I say. But if you listened to the two MPs uh, from two different parties, both on the, on very much on the right, who started the whole one, one and a half hour debate. Um, if they hadn't been reading about the whole theory of metapolitics themselves, they had some advisors who knew that theory backwards. And most people, I think, did not have a clue what, was, what theory was, was was being proposed and and and, and won the vote in the end. Mm. Uh, but it was definitely meta it was definitely metapolitics that was lying behind that. So this I think is is an is another aspect of the question that perhaps we need to bring in as well. We need to think about how does all this stuff impact mainstream politics? Mm. Because it does, I'm afraid impact mainstream politics. And they're trying to do, I mean, although the theory of metapolitics is to have a sort of indirect impact, th these guys have enough readers amongst members of parliament in various countries or amongst advisors of, mem of members of parliaments in various countries, that these theories do have an increasing impact on real live politics, not just on the internet fringes of society. I completely agree. Is, is that a historic hand, Jean-Francois? Or... No, it's, it's, it's a novel one, but you've had, if, if someone else wants to come in, I'm happy to. You can raise your hand or put questions in the chat if you want to say <laughs> No, I mean, I, I, just to follow up on Mark's point, I mean, I'm, I'm still amazed today at how many people are still not recognised the fact that, you know, what people sometimes call Trumpism, um, you know, is basically an ideological programme that was developed about 15 years earlier by Sam Francis, Paul Gardford and Pat Buchanan, integral, Right, that basically, you know, the Trump people just took, you know, America first. It was it was called America first. It was the same tropes. It was the same agenda. It was a critique of managerialism, the managerial state. It was there. It was, you know, he won. Okay, he lost the nomination in the end. Uh, he lost the he lost to to to, to George Bush uh, Buchanan in that campaign. But that was the campaign at the time, and this was simply sort of like taken by Bannon and his people, and and basically re, re for Trump, and and with very very little changes there. So these ideas matter a lot. They they influence you know, real politics in, in in ways that you know people still fail to recognize. It was strange when Trump was elected. He, he, the Guardians, all those journalists were like, "Oh, what does he read? What does Bannon read? Like the Ford, all, all these kind of thing." And actually, it's like they, they, then he came out with all those really far fetched kind of like science fiction book and like movies and stuff. Is, uh, and I was just like, "Well, just read Chronicles, you know, the, the main paleo sort of journals. They, what, it's all in there. It's basically it's mm. telling." Francis and Gottfried are telling Buchanan what to do if he wants to get elected, right? Uh, you have to run as an independent, you have to get out of the Republic, we have to transform the Republican Party, let them come to you, and it's, it's all exactly in the, and that, even still today, it's completely ignored. Um, mm -hmm. So these things, I think, matter a lot. And also, I mean, this is the, I'm sure everyone here knows this, of course, but what's important, the ways in which it, it influences politics is, is how it forces the center to move right, right? Uh, in practically all issues. I mean, the ways in which, 
you know, God, from 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 the Tories to New Labour to the Clinton mm-hmm. Democrats, and and the, 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 that radical politics, even though even if it doesn't win elections, it's moved the debate constantly further right. The centre keeps moving right. So even if you know, even if we said that they're cranks and all this, it's it's got a real uh, uh, important impact here on 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 this, and it's it's quite, you know, for for a lot of I had this difficult. I was struggling the other day because I was putting a course together and I said, I'm going to do a session for my third year undergrad on the radical right. And I was, I was generally sort of wondering, okay, I've got to be careful here. I'm going to, I'm going to do this. And, you know, how do you teach this? And, you, you know, it, some would find this very attractive because it's explained things in ways that are quite sort of, you know, make sense, you know, for, for, for many of them and all that. And I had a colleague said, oh, you can't do that. You can as well. And I, we can't be a politics department <laughs> mm-hmm. right? in, in a world where basically these guys are sitting in the White House and they're basically <laughs> taking us out of the EU. And we, you know, we can't talk about these things to our students. So, I mean, it does throw all sorts of difficult challenge, but we've got to find a ways to engage with that uh, mm-hmm. without, like Paul, like Sal said, giving them too much credibility and also make it sound like this is an unde- undef- you know, undefeatable monsters and then we do nothing and we end up sort of, you know, uh, mm. But I think engagement there must be absolutely. Um, mm. oh, I agree. Paula, did you have your hand up a minute, a moment ago, or did you want to come back in again? Are you talking to me? Uh, Paula. Oh, sorry, 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 big one. No, I'm finished. No. Uh, can you unmute Paula, Rob? No. I'm not able to unmute her. I don't know what's happening. Um, okay, now it's working. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering if, if if the case of Trump was not so successful because he was able to adapt uh, to completely new uh, media systems and dramatic uh, dramatic uh, 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 scripts that you didn't have before. Um, I mean, it's the the one thing is to try to shape reality right and to say okay we are trying to impose our view on reality the the thing that trump uh, succeed, succeed very well was to say it doesn't matter how it looks like it doesn't matter what what reality is we want to do a b or c uh, and you come with us and and he basically could establish many levels of understanding of what he was uh, proposing um, and was able to bring together groups which are not together before. So I, I, for this reason, I, I was thinking about my my question before. If um, if there is something new here um, that you do, didn't have before, and what are the consequences for uh, the far right? Are they obliged to? act differently to even to um, make new uh, intellectual commitments? Um, can they keep with some crucial ideas or can they not do that or it doesn't matter at all? Um, that's a little bit my question to the participants. I think Jean-Francois is leaping in. Yeah, thanks Paul. I think this is, this is very good. And I mean, this is just a partial answer. Obviously it's a big question. <laughs> um, but I think one thing we mustn't forget here is is it's not so much that you know it doesn't matter. I mean, maybe it is. It's not. Is that the conditions were were right in some ways, right? I mean, it, it is a situation of of liberalism, of li- the, the, the difficulties of the, the erosion of liberal orders themselves, based in you know, the, the, um, globally, domestically, um, which created conditions for. So a lot of people felt that they were not represented by the you know, Republicans or by the Democrats. Right? They felt that they had been left out since the 1970s, 1980s by all these basically turbo capitalist sort of you know uh, uh, programs. The they felt that the you know the culture wars was tended to basically sort of uh, the, the political correctness was basically depriving them of you know having a right to, to value these things and believe in these things, and no one was speaking for them. And there was a sense that there was no one articulating their their, their position. And again, Francis and Godfrey were very good about this in nineteen eighties, nineteen nineties. Is that you know this is there is no one representing Middle America. Right, basically, it's all an East Coast, West Coast thing, and the rest of Americans are not being. So, Trump, in some ways, uh, was able to uh, 
rally different kind of weird sort of like group of people in, in some kind of weird coalitions, uh, precisely because in many ways people felt that they were disenfranchised by liberal politics since the end of the Cold Wars and maybe, maybe even before that, and that no one was really offering something else. And in the end, it was the kind of like, you know, fuck the establishment attitude of Trump that people were attracted to, right? If they, they knew he was lying, they knew that, you know, but there was something here about Precisely the, 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 that kind of rejection of the rules and norms, the conformism of you know the main, of mainstream politics that you know was quite pleasing, it, it, even it, perhaps even for, simply from from an aesthetic perspective, to many people. Right, it's something quite similar with Boris Johnson. Everyone knows he's a clown. Everyone knows he's you know basically uh, uh, not going to deliver on half of his promises. What happens to Project Moonshot? What happens to all those things that he comes up with? But they find him aesthetically sort of you know funny and sort of you know anti-establishment, and they find that there's something refreshing about that. Um, so I think that a lot of that kind of things that Trump has done at least for me, was very specific to the moment at the time. I'm not sure you could come back and do something again like in another round in the same way. Or at least not in the same way. So I think I've not been able to see questions that have been going in the chat, so sorry if I was oh. ignoring questions in the chat, but uh, so I'm getting them forwarded to me now. So I wonder, Andy, Andy, do you want to ask your question or shall I ask it for you? He doesn't. He wants to, wants to ask it for me. Okay, so Andy, no, colleague, populist uh, scholar, of populism from from Brighton. He says that he he marks as a distinction, but here between the new right as intellectual movement project of certain key figures, and then there's this kind of question about the real world effects. How do we kind of make that difference? So he's asking, I think, very sensibly, kind of, well, what is the, what's the difference here? The the 2008 crisis with the neoliberal project. I mean, to what extent should we understand this kind of shift that, that, that what didn't work under Pat Buchanan, say, in 1992, does work in some modified form in 2016 with Trump? How much of that is because the kind of, the, what, he, this is my words, not Andy's, there was a kind of, there was a crisis of the managerial state caused by the, that is linked to the financial crisis in 2008. Is it that political opening that's bringing things forward? I mean, I would add, that I think the difference is also the internet, uh, which I think is a very significant means for this kind of countercultural politics. But um, yeah, so how do we understand that? So um, Mark, you, you you raised your hand there to respond. Yeah, I mean, I th I think we've we've already discussed the changes in circumstances, which which I think are are super important and are something that has has changed. Um, but I think there is there is a tendency to focus on the economic aspect of what's changed. Mm -hmm. And this is, of course, very important. I'm not saying it isn't important, but one shouldn't just focus on economics. And I think one has to one then has to look at aspects of I'm not sure what one calls them, the culture wars that are have got nothing to do with economics, because, you know, we, we've had this discussion. Um, about about Brexit, and there's there's some there's the idea that we can explain it away in terms of the lo the economic losers from globalization or the economic uh, losers from 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 neoliberalism or something, but it's not. I mean, it's not about economics. This this I think is one of the things that has changed that we've moved from a period where a very long period where an awful lot of things were about economics to a situation where, an awful, where, where things aren't necessarily about economics any longer. And if we look at the whole role played in today's new politics by questions of migration and religion, and uh, the, 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 in some ways this resembles uh, earlier discussions about race, but it isn't primarily about race for most people. I mean, in the United States, they, there's a somewhat different situation and, and, and race therefore comes up a bit more in the US than, than it does in, in the European right. But there, there, isn't, there isn't that much of a focus on race. But there is there is an enormous focus on culture, on maintaining our culture, on 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 our our national culture, our local culture, our regional culture, our culture under threat, and um, 
I, I think that we have to take the concerns of people who have who have these concerns at face value rather than to say well yeah you know they may think it's about feeling their culture feels threatened in fact it's an economic threat to their interests uh i i i think that we have to we have to prepare to to, to think to understand there's things going on out there that are not particularly to do with economics that the crisis the part of the crisis that's made the space for all these new developments uh really is about culture in 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 this um perhaps ethnic sense i'm not sure so i think that's really interesting I mean, i'm not sure how much i mean i think it's a complicated question about how we understand the economics at issue here but it does seem to me that that, that maybe one might characterize in part a metapolitical moment as one in which existential questions take a certain prominence over kind of questions of policy and that, that, that might be seen as questions of kind of immediate interest and return in, 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 in the marketplace. It seems to me we are in that sense in a metapolitical moment where these questions are, are kind of raised up. I'm, I'm maybe kind of connecting, I'm going to segue kind of unhappily here because there's a question here I didn't uh, see from Henry Price. I don't know if Henry wants to ask it, but I'd particularly like to hear kind of Eve's questions about it because it touches on this question of how the radical right um, connects to questions of gender. Uh, not just patriarchy, but masculinity and masculinity as a kind of inhabited identity. And this will come up again later in the week when we're going to be addressing some of these issues very directly. Um, so what, what Henry says is that he's, he thinks the radical right is deeply interested in gender, but not always seeking to restore patriarchy. So I take it obviously means the kind of the identities that individuals experience. And what do you, what would you, what would you, how would you react to that? Yeah. Um... Yeah, so, yeah, um, I think that masculinity is really at stake um, um, for many, many uh, theorists and activists on the radical right side. For instance, uh, some have developed um, um, real um, new ways of life, you know, to try to um, to get back or to, to, uh, to assert their masculinity and thinking um, of someone like Jack Donovan, who is a masculinist, who, who really um, uh, who has um, worked on the body and, and uh, who has developed some kind of masculine ethos. And I think this is very important. The body, in yeah, the body in general and the masculine body is very important, I think, for, um, for um, some uh, radical um, right-wing thinkers and and I, uh, actually if we think uh, from the, the perspective of, of um, uh, the history of ideas it's some kind of also Nietzschean you know rela relationship to oneself which is developed in a, in a, in a kind of um, more gendered um, discourse um, so yes I think it's uh, it's uh, yeah it's very important from this point of view but also uh, when you were uh, you, you are talking about patriarchy so I, I, I I would like to come back to what uh, Mark said a bit before, because he said that many radical right-wing thinkers are not conservative. It depends on what you mean by conservative. I think it's interesting. And then you said they are not concerned with patriarchy. Um, so could you also please elaborate on that? Because it, it's a bit, I'm a bit puzzled, you know, by this assertion. Um, um, that, I mean, well, I, th I think it's actually what what you're saying. I mean, they're they're interested they're interested in gender. I mean, the war the warrior monk is 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 an extremely masculine uh, masculine construction. Mm. Um, but the if you, if you're if you're totally focused on on if you the, the warrior monk doesn't need to be a patriarch. The warrior monk is the warrior monk. Uh, women, children, peasants, and butterflies, you know, can, can, can go their way. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the idea that, um, I mean, when, when, I, when I try to think, I mean, Don, Donovan is, is not interested in patriarchy. He's interested mm -hmm. in masculinity. Yeah. 
Yeah, but he's he's not interested in trying to restore any particular model of family relations. I mean, in fact, his conception of, of family relations is about as unpatriarchal as you can yeah, possibly. There is a reason for this, you know, because masculinity is also associated with sexuality um, in his case. So yes, I mean that's to say his 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 uto his masculine utopia is now hold on he he hates the word gay doesn't yeah, he yeah yeah he does yeah he hates the word gay it's something yes. different but it's uh, it's about men having sex with men because yeah. you know if you're a real man do you want the to demean man, yeah. yourself to have sex with a woman uh, and that i mean you know, so it's very interested in gender but i wouldn't describe that view as particularly patriarchal that that's what yeah, i was true. thinking of yeah, i mean I Okay, I, I, be, I understand better. I just wanted, you know, to hear you yeah. on this point. Yeah. No, that's that's. I mean, you know, this is your area, not mine. So you can probably now list a lot of people who 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 really do want to restore. But what version? What version of patriarchy? You know, mm -hmm. do we want to restore the 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 nineteenth century version or the fourteenth century version? Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah, but it also depends on what thinkers we are talking about. For, for Donovan, yeah, Donovan is a case, but someone like like Spencer speaks a lot about family, and 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 yeah. many thinkers speak speak a lot about family because also family is the foundation of society, of race, of white race, of civilization, and so on. So yes, and that's is, certainly is you're absolutely issue. right so, there. I mean, the there are patriarchy is at stake, you know, and it's very yeah. very important. Yeah. yeah. And so there, there are connected to patriarchy. Yeah. I have to correct what I said. I mean, there are there there are, there are indeed people who are interested in patriarchy in terms of restoring the family and so forth but it's far from universal and there are there are a lot of people who 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 either have no interest in this or or actually support a a model which is completely incompatible with yeah. that but but well, it's also because you you speak about traditionalist maybe maybe it's a, it's all you yeah because yes, I mean, you know, the, 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 the ever, ever, forever the, the, the bourgeois family was bourgeois, and the one thing he wasn't was bourgeois. Yeah. He thought. Is that, a, is that you wanting to come in on this question? Uh, oh, you, yes. Uh, well, and I was going to, I was going to answer the previous <laughs> uh, query. <laughs> do, do you want to move on? That's fine. Um, well, I just, well, we are sort of heading into the home straight. Uh, it's 10 to 7. So I just wonder if we, maybe this sort of, we can segue this because there's a question here of what is this, these range of movements, what are they for? And there seems to be some incoherence and clarity as to what they're for. And that strikes me that's partly because at the moment they're primarily against. And that's part of what unites them against the man of your state, against liberalism, against elites. So that raises a question which we haven't really addressed, which is populism. Is, there, is it right to think of these movements as populist if populism is meant to mean the attempt to mobilize us against the elite in some way? And, and how does that work when we're talking about movements that are on the one hand clearly elitist, uh, for the reasons Mark gave, the, the, the few strong warrior monks, or elitist in the sense of wanting to um, affirm certain kinds of inequality, yet positioning themselves as outsiders, as we were talking about earlier, as movements against the elite. So do, does the discourse of populism help us in any way to make sense of these, or does it get in the way? And, and, and use your response to say whatever you want <laughs> to kind of bring us to the close if there are things you want to say you haven't had a chance to say yet. Um, and I'll come to you if that's okay, Jean-Francois. Yeah, okay. Um, well, I mean, I think that I've got to be careful here because <laughs> The, I always find that populism is, is not a very helpful way to think about a, a, lot, a lot of that stuff. That in many ways, it's something that got, got graft onto that kind of politics, you know, in the 1990s. Uh, and that, that political party people use a lot more than actually those intellectuals that we've been talking about. Um, in, in many ways, you've seen debate in the 1980s, 1990s between the intellectuals, especially in America. Should we go populist? Should we use that? Should we actually try to do that? Um, and ultimately, you know, one thing that, what populism for them at least serve as a way to identify, you know, which ties into this whole managerial narrative, which is basically liberal managerialism is about, it's an, it's an alliance between a liberal elite 
and its clients, right? Refugees, asylum seekers, ethnic minorities, LBGTs and all that, right? They provide uh, a center for like a clear enemy to target against which we can actually blame someone for the problems that are in, happening in, 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 a, in a given society. It, it provides, it puts a figure on a particular, okay. Now, um, what's up to be, at least, for them, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with being elitist. <laughs> it's just about what kind of elite. Uh, and and that, that is the thing here, okay? Uh, and certainly, at least for the people that I've been talking about, I, I'm not speaking about you know, political party leaders, are, you know, that's not my thing, but certainly for these people, the problem with the, the, with the managerial elite, is with the bourgeois elite, is that it, it, they lost their nerves. So like Pareto used to mean, the, the, what happens with, with, with any elite is after a while, ultimately they circulate because, you know, they lost their nerve and they can't govern over the world that they've created and another elite comes in and then the, the, the other one loses their nerve as well and so on. And the problem with the bourgeoisie is that they become too comfortable right, and too effeminate and, and uh, emasculated and so on. And what we need is an elite that is much more decisive, that can take decisions, that can you know, show the way much more. Yeah. Um, so I always struggle a little bit with that kind of populism as, as a way into these things because ultimately a lot of these arguments, you could say that, for, for instance, populism is the new ways in which that kind of like struggle between you know, land-based power and maritime air-based power, you know, the Anglo-Saxon version of how you should rule the world in a more continental way, expresses itself today. Right? It's a critique of globalization. It's a critique of you know, abstract, you know, abstractions of human rights of, in, as, as opposed to territoriality, nativism, uh, and a citizenship tied to particular land and blood and soil and all that. So populism is a thing that kind of maps onto a whole range of different things, but it's very difficult to actually, at least for me, use as the main conceptual vector to understand these things. Thank you. Mark? I agree that I don't find populism uh, a very helpful way of understanding this. Uh, and I agree it's interesting to, to look at what they're actually for as opposed to what they're actually against. I think that with many ideal political ideologies, uh, what one is against is developed uh, in far greater detail than what one is for. Because, of course, you know, that's the difficult bit. What does one want to replace the system with? It's, it's easy to be critical of Zoom, but can I produce a better what version myself? And the answer, of course, is no. Um, so I, I, I think that the, what, what, the, what they're for, the, the, the utopia, is, is less emphasized, is less clearly developed. But when one looks at it, there's, there is a vision of a world free of the managerial elites, uh, free of globalization, free of liberalism, free of delusions of equality. And sometimes uh, this turns into something which, which is almost a form of anarchism. Um, the, the state seems to wither away and we have small ethnically homogeneous communities uh, living structured fairly informally. Um, and then sometimes when one begins to emphasize the rural uh, and the uh, consequent depopulation of the cities, it begins to look a bit like Pol Pot. But um, the, 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 it's, uh, I, th I think it's, it, in some ways it's a vision of freedom. And what then happens of this, with this rather special understanding of freedom uh, is not really defined. Thank you. Eve, the last word to you on whatever you think we need to hear. You've just muted yourself. You're... <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. I guess so I definitely agree. I think we should just stop speaking about populism or if you want to speak about populism, we should speak about left populism. Why not? But just as a category as well for the, the, the right, I, I think it's just absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it doesn't help. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so actually they are against many, many things, but the, the, this is also why they are reactionary. So I 
mean, we can close uh, to some extent this way because they react precisely to what um, what they they feel they think is um, uh, just a catastrophe. Um, and uh, it is actually their very very mode of operating. Uh, of conceptualizing, of thinking, and so on. And I think this is also why it's very, very, uh, it works actually, it works because they, as we, they will always have someone to fight against. So, uh, and after in terms of content, yes, they are, they are of course, I'm, a bit, I'm exa exaggerating a little bit, but I mean, they are more, I think they are more defined by what they are against that than by what they are really for and at, and at least uh, if we try to think of them uh, in some kind of unitary uh, point of view which is very very uh, difficult but i think this is what we can all agree upon at least the reaction the, the fundamental character of uh, of uh, the reaction uh, component um. thank you eve okay so i'm gonna draw things to a close because we are at seven o'clock by thanking everybody for coming along and giving your time to us and sticking with us thanking particularly our speakers uh, Mark Sedgwick, Yves Giannoncelli and Jean-Francois Droulet and behind the scenes my colleagues Rob to pink absolutely Rob Gallagher who's been kind of managing all the tech things and so forth. I'm sorry if I uh, didn't get all down to all your questions um, but do come back tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow we will be talking about the topic mapping online extremism and the far right so we're looking at a different so part of this kind of broad mosaic moving away from some of these uh, deep reactionaries to the kind of more neo-fascist and other similar movements. We'll have Alexandra Minister, specialist in far right and eugenics and race, poli race politics in America. Uh, Matthew, um, I've, forgotten to, I've forgotten names of all the people we have coming tomorrow. <laughs> Matthew Lyons from Third Way Fight, uh, Bethan Johnson from the Centre for the Study of the Far Right, uh, and Annie Kelly, who works on uh, QAnon and related kind of conspiracy movements. So we can fit out our broad picture. I hope that some of you come again tomorrow. Uh, but for now, thank you very much and have a good evening and good night.